Hello everyone, Karen Glasser here and welcome to this episode of The Passion Point. This is a show where we follow passionistas from all around the world who are following their passion, making a living, doing what they love. And today we have the amazing Marianne Cherico. She is a personal and professional development coach who helps baby boomer women <laughs> all over the world create a life filled with joy, passion, and purpose so that they can create the most amazing second half. Um, she's proud to be a member of this generation of women who changed the world for women, presenting future generations with limitless, that's hard to say, limitless <laughs> opportunities to thrive and grow into lives that are meaningful and authentic. And she's a new grandma too. So I am so happy that you're with us today. Welcome to the show, Marianne. How are you today? I am so great and I'm so happy to be here. Well, we are both then just as happy with each other being here. I, and I'm, I, we were talking about your background. Those sunflowers don't even look real. And I know they are. They are amazing. You're right. They look like a Van Gogh piece of artwork or something. Just amazing. So I want to thank you for being on the show. And we like to start the show with the word passion. And what does it mean? Now, Webster's Dictionary says that passion is an intense driving or overmastering feeling or mm -hmm. conviction. What does Marianne say? Yeah, it's so funny because I, I all my life have felt so strongly about the word passion. Um, and I think it's something that just wells up inside of you when you're doing something that just makes your heart sing. And I know that there's been many things in my life at different periods of my life that I've felt really passionate about. At one point, I was a dramatic arts major and I, I did a lot of theater and um I was completely passionate about that. And then in my 30s, it became more about art. And I studied art and I worked a lot in art. And, um, you know, as life evolves, I think different areas of your life are filled with different passions. And I think it's something that you just, your gut just knows that it's something that makes you happy. It fulfills you in a way that other things don't. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great definition. Now, you work with baby boomer women, and we're going to get to that, but let's talk about the journey that you took to get to where you are today. You can go as far back as you want, maybe not in utero, but you know, as far back <laughs> as you want. Um, I have obviously have babies on the mind. And um, tell us a little bit about the journey. How did you become um, the baby boomer woman coach? How did you get here? That's such a really good question. Um, as I said, Back in the day when I went to college, I was a theater major and that was, I was incredibly passionate about that. And I was tunnel vision passionate about it. But when I had my daughters, my three daughters, everything changed and they became my number one. They became what I was passionate about, being their mother and witnessing their life and helping them, you know, try to help them be good people and be strong, but compassionate and all the things that comes along with being a mother that we all take for granted that, you know, mothers do and, and parents do. And so they became my passion. And in the meantime, I would do things that filled me up as well, because I think that it's so easy to get lost in your kids and, and, it happens very, very, it happened very easily for me. So I ended up selling real estate because that was a way that I could drive them to school and pick them up. And so I did that for 27 years. And in 2005, I opened up a home staging business as well. So I was doing both. And all through the years, especially when I was young, I had such a traditional mother and I really didn't have a role model for how to be in the world in business. So I had to learn a lot on my own. Um, and I think that a lot of us baby boomer women really haven't had the mentors or examples that we need in order for us to succeed in business. We thought we had to fit into a man's world or be like men in order to succeed. And, that, you know, it, it, we really had to learn a whole new paradigm about business and how to be a woman in business and right. how to, you know, sometimes work a gazillion times harder for the same amount that men did. And so I know I'm sounding very feministic now, 
but it's true. Yeah. Um, I think that we are a very specific generation of women and our daughters don't understand all the hurdles that we had to jump in order to get where we are. So I always was very empathical to baby boomer woman, women because I know how hard it was for me. And um, I've always loved women and I've always felt like we should champion each other um, as opposed to compete with one another. So there's so many reasons why I chose baby boomer women, but um, I think mostly because I think they're a very special group of women who change the world for women and yet deal with their own demons inside for really soaring to their own personal greatest heights. So when we say baby boomer women, we're talking about the age range of anywhere Generally, between? Yeah, well, it's, it's women that are born between 1946 and 1964, although I do believe that a lot of the things that I talk about affect women in their 40s as well, um, because it's all about transitioning and transitioning into being really intentional about who you're meant to be. You no longer, you know, most of us have gone through bringing up our children and now it's kind of like, who do I intentionally really want to become? What business do I really want to intentionally create? Or how do I want to recreate my business so it supports my life better? Because as we get older, we realize how precious time is. We were just talking about that. And, right. you know, time is the currency that is finite on earth. Right. That's so the best true. of our knowledge. <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> right. To the best of our knowledge. Exactly. So, okay. So uh, obviously I'm, I'm a baby boomer woman, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I'm not on the 40 year old age, obviously, mm -hmm. but you know, on the older end. And I, I know that there it's the best of times and the worst of times, right? It, it as a, as a, a woman of a certain age, and I like to say that, and I say that with a smile on my face because I'm very happy to be where I am. I would not want to be any other age than I am, but I know that there's a certain amount of challenges. You mentioned, you know, as a mom, we get very connected to our kids, and sometimes we get way too connected to our kids. Mm -hmm. I'm guilty of that as well. I have a 31-year-old, and my youngest is 31. And yet, I mean, once a mother, always a mother, right? And how do we separate from, how do we, and I'm asking a question now, as a woman, how do mm -hmm. we separate the mom in us mm -hmm. with the, the rest of our world and the rest of our life in the second half of our life? How, how do you coach people on this? I think what's really important to it is to not negate that part of you because, you know, part of our passion is being mom. A lot of us, that, that fills us up in a way that nothing else does. Right. Um, I still love being a mom to my daughters. It, it lights me up. However, I think what we have to do is be more intentional. And by that, I mean, we have to really know what do we want with our careers? How do we want to make money to help our families? Um, just setting aside time where this is work time. This is building on my business time. This is time that I'm going to work on something specific and then working in our business and really kind of scheduling out that time so that we're intentional about building our business in a way that we leverage our time better, that we're more conscious of our, you know, how productive we are right. as opposed to wasting time being busy instead of productive. There's all kinds of tools that we can do, but I think the big word, the big buzzword for me is being intentional. I love that. That's a great, that's a great word being intentional. And, and I've heard people say, I've heard a lot of people say, you know, working on your business versus working in your business. How would you differentiate between the two and why are both important? Well, it's so funny. I think it's so easy to get caught up in your business. If you're a business owner, um, your business kind of takes over your life. Let's face it. You, don't, you, you started your business because you thought you'd have more time and you're finding yourself working nights and mornings and weekends and so I think that we become very reactive in our business and we're kind of jumping for everybody. I call it the puppet on, on the string yeah. syndrome, where our customers are our puppet masters and we're constantly jumping, putting out fires. Um, and, and I think we have to be strategic about working on our business. What systems do we need to leverage our time better? Who do we need to be delegating things that are... Um, tasks that aren't our vein of gold, that aren't the things that we're really proficient in. I want to spend my time coaching people. 
I don't want to spend all of my time, you know, doing admin work and bookkeeping work. So how do I develop systems or farm out that kind of work? What marketing programs do you want to do? Um, that would be working on your business. Even, you know, one day you could set out a chunk of time to say, I'm going to plan my marketing for the year. Um, and I'm going to figure out what social media needs to be done and, you know, PR and all that. This is so important because I think a lot of people think that they can just show up on any given day and just whatever happens to come by their desk. Oh, I think I'll go work on that right now. What you're talking about is being intentional mm -hmm. in not just what you do, but when you do it and how you do it. So a marketing calendar would be a perfect example for the, or a social media calendar. So instead of saying on any given moment, I think I'm going to go show up in Facebook right now and just look at a couple of things and like it. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people that do that, um, but maybe a more intentional way of doing it is scheduling time in your calendar, possibly, mm -hmm. that says that on these days, I'm going to go in and post these three things and literally have a calendar. Uh, right. Do you use a marketing calendar or do you use a regular calendar? How do you track or structure your time so mm -hmm. that you are working on your business? Well, one, one of the things I do with my social media is every week I write a blog and I try to write something that has huge value to people. I like to work with baby boomer women, but my real avatar is baby boomer women who have a small business right. um, because I can relate to that. I right. can relate to these women and I feel as though those are the women that I really enjoy coaching. I coach a lot of home stagers, real estate agents and different business people. So I, every week I write a blog, I send it to my virtual assistant and she populates it on social media. So she, I think she uses Hootsuite mm -hmm. and um, I think she has to input the LinkedIn posts. Right. So that way I'm trying to stay top of the mind with people. Um, I also periodically check and if somebody posts a comment, I respond to that because I think it's really important to acknowledge that right. people, if they share your post or if they post a comment, that you acknowledge that you see that because it makes people feel good and want to support you more. Well, it, and it's more than that actually, Marianne, because that's the way the algorithms work on Facebook or any of the social media platforms. If you don't respond then there is a, an algorithm that says, well, you're not engaged with these people, right. and therefore they're not going to see your posts because mm -mm. unless you actually have a, co a conversation, which is kind of a unique concept, imagine that, a conversation <laughs> on social media, we're not there just to kind of what I call throw up all over the place mm -hmm. and, you know, mm -hmm. and then not respond. So number one, it's important to interact and have a, that conversation. And also, I think you probably would agree, and I just wrote a note, you want to work on those income producing activities, you right. yourself. And right. delegate whatever else you can because if you're not, you're the one as the individual, as the small business owner, you're the one who is creating the income, not your VA or not right. your whoever you're delegating to. You're responsible for that because if you're not, then you don't have a business. Absolutely. And I think it's so easy to get caught up in being busy mm -hmm. and thinking that we're doing great. Oh, I'm so busy. I'm so busy. But if you're not focusing on how you're going to, you know, do your income producing activities and really strategizing on what's most important for you to be doing. The other stuff will fall away. They'll work themselves out or you'll get to them, you know, when you can. And believe me, I'm a get or done kind of girl. I don't like to, you know, not tie up all my loose ends, but I think that you have to be really strategic about focusing on working on your business and then the other time can be spent working in your business. So that might mean blocking out time a couple days a week or even one morning a week where you say, I'm going to, even if you're just beginning, you can say, I'm going to work on Facebook strategies, but first I need to learn about which ones to use. Should I do graphics? Should I do Facebook live? Should I do a blog? What do people resonate with? So maybe you take that time and you research. It's just spent on researching right. so that when you do it, you're not just, you know, like you said, throwing spaghetti on a wall. You're being strategic and intentional right. about how you're spending your time. Maybe even do a survey. Maybe right. even, you know, it's, mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of us, not just women, not just baby boomer women. I think mm -hmm. we show up and we think we have this concept in our head of what we think our customer wants. Yeah. When in fact, we 
a lot of us have not even asked the question, is this something that you want? Or what is it that you want? You can have the best program in the world. You can be the best coach in the world. But if nobody wants what you're selling, yep. you got a problem there, right? Yeah, I absolutely agree. In fact, I'm taking Amy Porterfield's class. And one of the things I'm doing for my next program is I, I developed a survey because I want to know not only what my customers want, but the words in which they say what they want. Right. Because that helps with your copywriting. It helps you connect heart to heart to them. And it gets into what they want on a deeper level because you're actually using the words that they use. What keeps them up at night? What is it that they're saying in their head? Right. And so, um, yeah. I mean, you and that's important because they're also going to search for that online. Right. And if your right. copy doesn't um, indicate that that is what you do, so what keeps you up at night, if that is, and we can go find out very quickly, go on Google and just start typing what keeps you up at night. And if people are actually looking for that, it will drop down in that, that pull-down window. Then mm -hmm. you might say, you know what, I might want to add those words to my copy because people are looking for that. But if you find that nobody's looking for that, then you might want to look for other words to use in your copy. Would you agree with that? I totally do. In fact, it's funny. I, um, I worked with a coach who I adore and my whole platform in branding was, you know, to create your smoke and hot second half. Right. And it's funny. I got a lot of pushback from baby boomer women, um, in different parts of the world, especially, you know, maybe England and a couple other places. So I'm second guessing how much I want to use that brand, even though I think it's exciting and juicy and all that. And I don't mean smoking hot, sexy. I mean, smoking hot, like, passion, right. you know, so that's a perfect, um, example. Yes. That's mm -hmm. a perfect example because mm -hmm. those words may have a different connotation in England. Right, exactly. And right. it might be even here, people might think I'm, I'm trying to get women to be more sexy. Well, yeah, but not sexy in, in the conventional way, sexy right. in the passionate, loving your life kind of way, you know? And, but the fact that, and it's interesting, we're having this conversation because I'm sure as you're saying this out loud, you're having to actually explain what you mean. Right. And when you have to explain it, because generally, unless, unless you have more time than everyone in the world where you can talk to everybody individually and explain what you mean. The only time that they're going to get visibility to you and actually know what you're talking about is when they read your copy or they're directed via social media because of copy. Um, so let me ask you a question. What do you, do you believe that our time is more important than money? I absolutely do. And I think the older I get, the more I think that. I mean, I always thought time was so important. I, I remember a long time ago reading a book called Time for Your Life by Cheryl Richardson. And it really talks about how we barter our time for money. And, you know, I've always been a really busy woman. It, you know, many years I worked seven days a week. I'm a go-getter. I'm a worker bee. Um, but I think that one thing that I wasn't taught as a blue collar young woman brought up in a blue collar family was that, you know, my, my dad always said, if you work really hard, you'll be rewarded. That's, that's the, you know, where you'll get the keys to the kingdom. And what I never really learned is wor about working smart and leveraging your time. Right. And so I'm trying to change that paradigm for myself and other women or men who, you know, kind of have that paradigm that if you work a million hours, you know, you're going to really be rewarded. It's not the truth. Yeah. You have to work smart. You have to leverage your time. And, you know, I believe that there's more important things in your life. We're complete humans and we need to make time for our grandchildren and to travel or do the things that make our heart sing. I love yoga. Yeah. So I can, I can have all of that. I just have to be very intentional. Intentional. There's the word again, being intentional in terms of your private, your personal life versus your business life. You know, I think about the word entrepreneur and I remember when I left my nine to five, well, I don't think I ever had a nine to five, but when I left my more structured job where I was on a salaried, um, you know, position, and then I became an entrepreneur, you know, I kind of fell into that thing. Well, I'm an entrepreneur. I can work whenever I want and not work when I don't want to work. And, and oh my gosh, after what, three months, it was like, this is the hardest job I have ever had. It is taking more hours than any job I have ever worked on. The only difference was it was mine. Yes. 
Um, but I don't want anyone out there to think that when to become an entrepreneur, it's like, oh, you know, you'll, th- what you're doing now is putting the hours in now so that later on you don't have to. Right. Exactly. Right? You're investing right. in your, in your, you know, business and it is exciting because it's yours and it's completely different than working for somebody else. So it's kind of like, you know, taking care of your own kids. I mean, you're going to, you just look at it differently. You know, it's, it's a heartfelt kind of thing. So when, when it's your business, it's the same. You're, you know, you feel passionate about your business, you're helping people, whatever it is that you do it, it lights you up. And I I do believe that it's important, even when it's hard to feel joyful about your business. So why is it important to define your customer? So that you're, Mm -hmm. I mean, why is that so important? And we hear this all the time. You don't want to show up and say, well, I do this for everybody. Yeah. But, But why not? So why is it important to define your actual ideal client? Well, there's a couple of really important reasons why you want to define who your ideal client is, or sometimes we call it our avatar. One is because you can market better, because if you market to a a wider pool, you're really marketing to nobody. So you really want to really understand who your ideal client is so that your marketing speaks to their needs. The other thing, and this is important in any business, is that your ideal client is not just um, a baby. Mine is not just a baby boomer woman. It's a woman who wants to transform herself, who is willing to be afraid and try things anyways, who believes me, who trusts me, who pays on time, who values what I bring to the table. So there's a whole list. I have a whole list of my ideal client. And the reason why that's so important, for instance, if I'm working with a home stager and she's working with somebody that keeps rescheduling the staging job when she has all the movers lined up and, you know, doesn't pay her on time and all that, is that really her ideal client? And is she okay with losing that client once she sets better boundaries? I guess the whole thing is that we can spend a lot of time having that life and energy sucked out of us by clients that are not ideal because we're doing a tap dance to try to keep them happy and maybe they'll never be happy. Maybe no matter who they have as a coach, they won't be happy. Those are not the clients I really want to work with and I don't want to expend all that amount of energy on people that kind of feel like an act of futility. I think it makes us feel bad about ourselves and um, I think it's worth it to actually give up money because it's, money is not as important as being joyful in your business and feeling like you're giving to your client. So step number one would be figure out who your ideal client is. And, and yes. by, by um, uh, demographic, economics, um, emotions, all those things go into it. And then yeah. I would guess that you're a proponent of firing any clients that don't fit into that mold. Yeah. And you don't have to do it in a mean way. I think sometimes you just set your boundaries and if they can't work around your boundaries, like maybe that client that doesn't pay, you have them pay up front. And if they don't want that, then they, they self-select out. Exactly. Fine. That's okay. You know, I love that. So, um, I, I know that you have a, a, um, a special for all of our, our listeners, mm-hmm. um, and it's going to be in the, in the run notes below. You guys know the routine. Go take a look down below. What are we offering our viewers today? Well, I'm offering them a report called Three Ways to Prevent Business Burnout. I think that a lot of times, um, especially type A people who are business owners, really don't see burnout coming. And it's really about taking back charge of your life and being more intentional. So yes, it's a report called Three Ways to Prevent Business Burnout. Okay, so we want people to go take a look at that and go opt in and get this report. Um, Obviously, the theme in this is being intentional. We want our viewers to be intentional, make that move, just do it, get off the dime, jump out of your comfort zone, whatever whatever works on your mindset, just, just go do it. What would you tell someone that came to you, though, and says, because you're very passionate, it's very obvious, and you, you, you talk in a passionate way, and you, you believe that passion is a very strong aspect of, of business. What would you tell someone that shows up on your doorstep and says, I've lost my passion. I don't even know what my passion is. I don't even know how to figure out what my passion is. Help! What would you tell them? I think that 
everybody feels passionate about something, but we have a lot of blocks that stop us. Maybe we don't think we deserve it, or maybe we think that, you know, who am I to feel as though I can do this? And usually it's not a one step fix, it's excavating them and, and getting to know them. And, you know, I can hear what lights people up and just the way they talk about something. So actually that's where coaching comes in handy. Right. It really does. It's, it's an excavation and it's, again, it might not happen in one session. It's an un, unraveling. And, and it's a process and, yes. and there is no quick and guys, there's no quick fix for anything really. I mean, you, you have to do the work. And, yes. and, and if it's, if you're going to have to do the work, you might as well do it on something you're passionate about. Right. Right. And even if that means finding out what that is, because right. obviously you're restless if you're questioning that. Right. I, I, I agree. You know, I love quotes. I love, I love how it starts my day. And, and every morning I'm like this, this crazy person going through different, <laughs> different platforms, social media, online, looking for that quote for the day. And today the quote is from, let's see here, Alexander Graham Bell. And he wrote, when one door closes, another door opens, but we so often look so long and so regretfully upon the closed door that we do not see the ones which open for us. Love that quote. Love, I love that. that. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, because we, hey, we're, I've, I've been guilty of that. We're, and I get focused on the negative rather than, oh, look at the opportunity. What's a quote that you like? You know, there's so many quotes that I like, but the one that comes to mind and it's something that I always want to focus on is feel the fear and do it anyways. Love because that. I think it's so easy to get caught up in our subconscious and conscious fears and stop ourselves from our magnificence. So, I, I love that. And also it, we're telling, be vulnerable, allow it yeah. just to, just to come in. And it, as women, I think as, I don't know if it's just a baby boomer thing, but I know in, in my generation being vulnerable was, is, is not a, an easy thing to be and and it and these last several years personally speaking i am learning how to be vulnerable mm. which sounds like such a weird thing to learn how to do but we just for the same things that you've been talking about we have worked so hard to get to where we are that there is that sense that if we allow ourselves to be vulnerable, that somehow we're going to be seen as less than. I don't know how mm -hmm. you feel about that. And, and part of that is because when we were in the corporate world, some of us, I, I was never in corporate. I was in the real estate world. But a woman crying or being vulnerable was, that was a major no-no. We were trying to fit into a man's world and we were trying to act more like men. And now we're realizing that vulnerability connects people. Right. That's, we love, you know, we love it when somebody's vulnerable with us, they're letting us in on their heart. That's a good thing. It is. It's really a good thing, I, I think. But it, it, I think it takes time to um, acknowledge that and, and for somebody to finally beat you over the head and to say, it's okay to be exactly who you are with the, not every, I'm, and I'm not suggesting guys that you go out and you be vulnerable with everybody and just share your right, entire right. personal life and everything that's going on. But we all have people in our lives that have opened up to us mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that we should, would also be just as comfortable to open up back to them. Because I think that's what resonates with people, as you said. And it takes a lot of guts. It does. It takes a lot of guts to be vulnerable. It does. It's scary as hell as for, for those of us who are in that journey. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I have a, quick, a, a fun question for you. If you could spread passion dust on mm -hmm. anyone, one person, group of people, anywhere in the world, who would you spread it on and what would you hope to accomplish? Mm. I, I think because my daughters are such a huge part of my life, I would spread it on them to just live their lives to the fullest and you know, feel the fear and do it anyways, but follow their heart and just you know, go big or go home. Just whatever it is, whether it's taking care of your baby or, you know, one daughter's a makeup artist and another is in, in uh, graphic design and marketing and another is an interior designer. And I want them always to feel passionate about whatever it is that they do in their life. Well, they're lucky to have, yeah. And they, they're lucky to have you as a mom. I mean, because this is, they're, they're, they have a great example 
and great footsteps to follow in. And, and I, I'm just so happy that you were able to join us today on the show. Is there anything else you want our viewers to know about you or about what you do that we may not have touched on before we say goodbye to everyone? Yeah, I'm working on a program and it's all about creating your life first and then creating your business around it because I think too often we create our businesses and as you said, we get completely all consumed in them and we really forget about what really matters most. And I think, again, it's about being intentional. And so I'm working on a program that is going to help women and men, if they are interested in creating the life that they want and creating their business around it so that they can have joy in both and be very successful in all areas, areas of their life, not just their business, not just their personal life, but all of it so that they're more fulfilled in their life. Oh, I love that. And they'll, they'll be able to find information on the course. Um, uh, yeah. as well as going to your website and all, to find everything that's going on. I encourage you guys to get to know this woman. Um, she's obviously the real deal. You can see it. And she's a grandma. I said that before, but she's awesome. She's awesome. I'm jealous, but, you know, that's just the way it is. I'm, you can and always I'm, adopt a grandchild. I could all, well, actually, I live vicariously <laughs> through all my, you know, all my siblings, their, their grandkids and all of that. So I totally love that. And I totally love what you're about. I want to thank our viewers because we know that you have a choice as to where you spend your time and how you spend your time. And we want to thank you for spending your time with us today. Mm -hmm. And so go out and give somebody an awesome day. And we'll see you next time on the next episode of The Passion Point. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you so much.